and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses and their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one advising services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, How Craft Beverage Producers Can Build High-Impact Events Programs, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network. We are recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Virginia SBDC Craft Beverage Assistance Program Manager, Chris Van Orden. Thanks very much, Sheila. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining us for this conversation about the ways in which producers can build successful events programs. Uh, my name is Chris Van Orden, and I'm the manager of the Craft Beverage Assistance Program at the Virginia SBDC at George Mason University. The CBA program is designed to provide industry-specific technical assistance to Virginia's craft beverage sector. So today's program will be a free-flowing conversation on how craft beverage companies can make the most of events. Uh, you'll be able to en uh, enter any questions that you have in the Q&A function, not the chat, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Q&A is easier from our end. So if you can uh, enter them in there, we'll be able to answer them during or after the subject of the, the webinar itself. So today, I'm very excited to welcome uh, my guest, Kathy Artis, uh, who I'm particularly thankful for joining us today, given I think that she's, uh, she's on travel. So thank you for that, Kathy. Um, Kathy has over 15 years of strategic partner engagement, corporate relations, and account management experience. Uh, she served as Director of Events and Hospitality at James and Dolly Madison's Montpelier, Director of Sales and Marketing for Blenheim Vineyard, and Events Manager at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Today, I'll be asking Kathy to share some thoughts on ways that uh, alcohol producers can uh, maximize the impact of their events programs. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for having me. It's, I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. So um, to, set, to set off, uh, maybe we can just do a little quick taxonomy what are the types of events that uh, a producer can host? What you know? What are the the range of options available? Um, you know the the kinds of events you can do are you know just endless, of course. But I would always encourage people to sort of walk before they run. Let's not start with the a five thousand person event, but let's start with a small event. Maybe it's um, a club event, a members only event. Um, celebrating a special holiday, a you know, just something to sort of get you up and running to know if these do, what kind of events are going to work for your space. I mean, do you have a small space? Do you have a large space? I think the kind of event really needs to fit your space, and it also needs to fit your mission and what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to get new people in the door? Are you trying to create more brand awareness? You know, are you trying to make money? So all these things need to be taken into account when you start to talk about events. Yes, I already like your your point about tying your events to your motivations, right? There's no single thing that events accomplish. It's got to be fit. So we will get to that. I, I really like that. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself and latch on to that because maybe to set things off, you said, right, um, starting off with something that you can get your arms around before maybe hosting a festival. So before we dive into the different categories of events, maybe we can lay some groundwork and talk about some kind of core events infrastructure that a producer should put in place for if they're going to do any kinds of level of events. Okay, that's a good place to start too. You know, getting getting the groundwork laid. One thing I think is really important, and I'm not sure if people think about this when they're thinking about infrastructure, is really getting buy-in from people, and that means from the top of the organization all the way down to the bottom of the organization. Especially if it's a big event with a lot of people, you need buy-in from your staff because you're going to have them working with you for you. So it's really good to have. Those people on board from the beginning instead of being told what to do but you know just let's try and get them on board as soon as possible and then again physical are there physical needs that you need to change do you need to increase your parking do you need better signage very basic things so people can find you easily um an exit plan in case of a storm or something bad there's got to be an exit plan an exit strategy a clear way out for everybody because those things do happen you, know, you never know um some infrastructure as far as are you going to have dedicated space? If you're talking about um, 
weddings that you want to do? Are you going to have a dedicated wedding space? Like some people do, they have a pad, people can put up the tent because if you're holding it in your tasting room, you're affecting the business, you're affecting the customers. So, you know, I think you need to figure out clearly what kind of events you want to do and then base the infrastructure around that. Um, Cause you don't want to have to recreate the wheel every time you have another event and say, Oh God, we never thought of this. So getting those things down is a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's, um, it's a, a, a good way to frame it. I think that so many people do ignore the sort of buy-in aspect. You know, people are very focused on the staff and right. The functional role as they play, Hey, I have my staff. I need to have my marketing and promotions person, you know, pushing out content on this side. Okay. That's the functional aspect of it. I may need to have my tasting room manager, uh, go and file for a permit or something like that, or add to the, you know, uh, certificate of insurance, but that's just, you know, the execution side from the top to the bottom, especially if it's not like the kind of, uh, executive, like the, the leader of the organization designing an event, there needs to be buy-in on all of these things, because if you're pushing against what people want to be doing that's where you know things get dropped people aren't really excited about it it doesn't make for a good user experience and so some of this is the sort of soft skill side of hey we like we all need to agree that there's a good reason to do this that we're all on board for it um because you can tell when people are being dragged along through an event exactly. and you don't want that and like for example when i worked at montpelier we did very large events and you know the montpelier races and stuff so you're talking about every single person who works there has to be they're all they were at the time when i did certain events they were required to be there for certain days so it's not just the marketing people, but the development people want something. They want to have a special experience for donors. Then you've got the people in the gift shop who are going to get hammered. Then you've got the grounds people who have to open and close gates. And, you know, it, it really affects everybody. So I think constant, constant communication from the very beginning is, is, is key. Constantly pushing out that communication, especially for large events. You just don't want people feeling like, Again, they're being told what to do instead of being asked, hey, how, yeah. how will this work? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, um, the, like, this is even more important if you have including volunteers, right? You know, there are some instances where you're bringing on volunteers and what does that mean? How are you motivating them? Um, you know, there's, I'm sure we could talk all about just staffing models alone, uh, but that's going to be tailored to the company, the event. Um, you know, the goals and all of that. So we can, uh, you kind really of want your, you want your A team, you want your A team greeting people. You don't want, you don't want the crabby guy at the front gate. You want, <laughs> you want to bring your A team. And that's nothing, especially regarding volunteers, really educate them. What is this event about? They might have questions about just the simplest thing. So educate your volunteers. I think that's very important. It just makes everybody look better. Where are the restrooms? Where's this? The, the more they know, the better off they can answer. And, and really, you know, set the right tone for guests coming in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I know we're maybe working backwards from the, uh, the sort of starting out with the manageable level, but the first thing that a lot of people think of when they're thinking of events in this space is the big swing, right? Whether it's a marquee festival or a marquee event, some big festival, maybe bringing in other entities, that kind of thing. Can you walk us through, you know, how you lay out, you know, your game plan if you're organizing a big festival, like when does the planning start, you know, who are you bringing buy-in, like, you know, we don't have to go through a full Gantt chart type thing, but how does that, how, how do you approach that? I think the, the biggest thing is what's your most important piece of that day? Is it a band? Is it a performer? Is it, you know, what's the biggest, hardest, most important get? So get that locked in first and then start planning backwards from that. For anything large, I always had a, a, a solid year. I mean, we're talking thousands of people, I always had a solid year to plan. Um, and literally that planning starts the day after the event ends, you start planning again. Mm -hmm. So take your biggest thing, start working backwards and filling in all the pieces. So if there are fireworks, you need a permit for that. You start walking, talking to the sheriff's department. If there are road closures involved, again, that's the county. Um, if there is music, of course, getting that locked in, 
and vendors, if you want food vendors, trucks like that, those people all really get booked out, you know, ahead of time. Like there are a lot of festivals that go on in Virginia, a lot of events at the vineyards, at the breweries. So these people, you know, a lot of the popular ones will get booked out in advance. So get your key things locked up first and then just start putting together a plan. Really here's, you know, what happens to happen, you know, six months out, five months out and keep winnowing that down. And again, keeping, always getting input from your other team members. Well, this guy over here is in charge of fireworks, but what has to be done in that area to make sure the fireworks are actually gonna go? The Marine Corps band is going to be here. They mm -hmm. need to be fed. They need a place to change clothes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into these big events. So um, I had operations plans that were very, very detailed because they had to be. But then also don't be afraid to delegate. If you've got this chunk of maybe it's just the food vendors, you've got somebody reliable that you can de delegate that this person becomes in charge of all the food vendors, you know, who just taking that piece. And I, I think I was very fortunate. I had really good staff working with me. So you figure out somebody that sometimes you just have to delegate. It's still gonna come up through you, but find somebody to give those pieces to. Let the people who are really good at that take it and run with it. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's good to you know keep that if, if you're assigning things to other people, especially if it's their first time being very clear with the expectations saying, hey, this is what you are. This is your timeline. Because like you said, I mean, all of these things kind of cascade, you know, you have to lock in your big piece first and then working backwards, knowing that even just picking a date can be difficult. Things, things get booked up. It's not like people are festivals and big events are being scheduled evenly throughout the year. So knowing what's happening around you, are you competing with yeah. other people? That's um, a key point. If somebody else has this big thing going on every single year on this date, don't take that day. You know, yeah. just, <laughs> there are some things that you just, you have to really be calendar conscious, I think. Yeah. And, and you mentioned road closures and the next, you know, getting into the permit and licensing side, which those can take a while. And, you know, you, you start that process and you find out, oh, we can't close that road because there's a marathon running right in front of your place yeah. that day. Well, that might put a wrinkle in your plans, right? If you can't get people physically to your site. So thinking about, hey, for these big events, what's it going to take? You know, we need to get a thousand people to this space, um, you know, it, it can feel pretty dry to go into a, you know, your, your town or county to try and get additional, you know, some sort of uh, license or permit for additional parking, but it can make all the difference. Um, you want, yeah, you want to be friends with those people. Those are your friends and the people at the ABC, you want to be friends with those people too, because you don't ever want to forget the ABC people, because if there's training that needs to be done, there's licensing, there's, that should be put out on your calendar. One of the very first things too, to make sure you don't never run a follow the ABC. That's that's just not a good idea. And they're very willing to work with you, but put those at the top of your list. You, those are people yeah. that you want to keep in the loop. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. I mean, for every producer, you know, has lots of hands-on experience with their ABC. This is a different thing, um, and it, it, it's an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, I am. I think it's maybe if there were five takeaways for every producer, regardless, make sure your ABC is aware of what you're doing. They hate feeling surprised. So if they find out that you're doing a festival that you didn't get your service area expanded to include your parking lot, they're not going to be happy and they will find ways to make your life harder. So absolutely, absolutely. They, they want, they want and, to be consulted. <laughs> and in some case, the neighbors, you know, if you're depending on where you're located, don't, you know, don't forget about your neighbors. You, you, yeah, you know, inform them, give them free passes, whatever it takes to keep the neighbors happy. I mean, it depends where you are, of course, and what's going on, but sometimes there are neighbors involved and you just want to make sure you keep those people in the loop too. Yeah. And so, you know, there's the, you know, doing everything on the front end, laying all that, you know, strong groundwork just to make sure that you feel like you have all of your bases covered. Then obviously growing the audience for that, using all every marketing tool available to you. And then we get to the day. And so can you talk a little bit about um, how you approach that, whether it's, you know, as if you're the field marshal of making sure everybody's somewhere, the delegation of teams, how, how do you typically structure the, when things start getting crazy? Yeah, I think that's really important. Again, it's delegation. Okay. 
you're the expert in this area, so you take it and run with it. You're the parking expert now, so you take your team and you run with it. Because we've already discussed what needs to be done and that expert is going to take it and run with it. And again, we've always had really wonderful people to work with who were good at their job and knew how to handle volunteers. But again, it's just all about the communication. And also, as far as the big events, it's good to partner with other people sometimes, too, because they can bring financial resources. They can bring more bodies. They can bring wisdom. So if you're a winery and you want to partner with somebody, a, a food company, whatever, but it's, you know, it's nice to do some combinations and a little bit of partnership because they help, again, bring bodies, bring knowledge, you know, so that's that's something I, re I recommend, too, if you get somebody that, that's easy to work with. But then again, for the day of, you know, again, just sticking to your plan, look, watching deadlines and watching, you know, just stick to your plan because you put that plan in a place for a reason. And then having lots of eyes and ears open, walkie talkies with cell phones, whatever. Back in the day, you know, we used a lot of walkie talkies back then because oh, sometimes you can't get cell service. So think yeah. about that too. And if you've got people coming in, if they're going to pay at the gate somewhere, if there's no internet, there's no swiping, you know, there's no paying at the gate. So keep those things in mind too, whether you need to boost it somehow. But think about that. If you have people to pay at, pay at the gate, be sure they're able to pay at the gate. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about exceeding bandwidth or if you have somebody, you know, at the end of the driveway taking payment, well, your wife exactly. might not extend there. So yeah, that's exactly. all of those little details. And, you know, um, this kind of gets to the next question that I have, which is saying that, hey, you're going to learn about this you know, every time you do it, you're going to improve, right? Be taking the time to learn the lessons from this, memorialize the, the the lessons learned by actually doing a debrief with your team, making sure that, you know, you have a way to get feedback from the public so that, hey, we have to make sure we don't make the same mistake twice, that kind of thing. So that gets into the recurring nature of this. So whether it's a, you know, annual festival you do every year for the release of a product or tied in with some major event or the more uh, every day, you know, the weekly recurring events, your trivias, your uh, live music, whatever that may be, um, those can be really impactful too because of the ongoing nature. You build an audience that way. These are maybe regular customers who you build. So can you talk a little bit about how a company can build an audience through these kinds of recurring events? I think those are great because they're very low lift. Like you said, a trivia or um, maybe it's a game night, maybe, or, you know, like it's Thursday night football or something like that, but just these kind of things, they're relatively low lift. But I think what's the best thing about these is people have them in their mind. They're on there, you know, every Thursday night, this is where you go because it's really fun. And then, oh, I'm going to bring a friend. So you've got your best customers now who are going to bring a friend because it's really fun or they meet a friend there. I think that's the best part is just the interaction because you're bound to see the same people over and over. If it's that kind of smallish you know some of these things you will see the same people every month or every whatever it is and so mm -hmm. that's that's the best case scenario because then you're again somebody's going to bring a friend along and tell somebody else and you know that's you've got all these little mini ambassadors out there now i think people who come frequently they are your ambassadors they want they're coming back for a reason they feel good when they're there they have fun they're the ones that are going to bring you more and i think and ultimately that's what you're trying to do with the events right is get create the long lasting, the, the lifetime value of your customer. You're trying to make it as high as possible. If you could keep him coming back and keep that person bringing more, that's going to increase their value over the lifetime. And that's really what you want. We all know it's easier. It's much less expensive to keep a customer than to bring on a new one. So if you keep those customers, your best people happy, they're going to bring on the people for you. I think that's, that's a good thing about these recurring events. Yeah. And I, it's a, very important concept for people to grasp. It happens a lot when you're talking about, you know, actual sales out in the, the world, but it's important to think about how events can build that lifetime value for an individual customer. So, right, you know, it's these festivals, there may be a huge money out, money in, you may have a, a really good day, but the lift required for that, you can't, there's like a, a max as to how many of those big marquee events that you can do in a year. These other ones, right, I mean, they're, they move along, they require like far fewer resources to stand up. And each individual person who comes is probably going to be a more regular customer. You probably get more lifetime value out of the 
person who plays trivia every week than the person who comes to your festival once a year. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and again, there, there's so much less staff resources involved in these small events. The big ones suck up so much staff resources. You, you, you really gotta be willing to put some into it. So these recurring ones, and they're flexible. You can mix it up and they're easy to, and they're easy to add, you know, they're easy mm -hmm. to just, they're just easier, you know, and, and people are generally lighthearted. You know, it's not like most cases, they're not even, there's not even a charge for it. If it's trivia night, you know, so there's not even a charge for a lot of these things, but you know, it's a good way to get people out and create yeah. some goodwill. Definitely. It doesn't stretch your staff. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's, this may work up to the festivals, right? So it may be, you have the recurring weekly events, then maybe every month there's a slightly larger event, then those can get spun up into quarterly events. So yeah. this can be a, a growing thing over time as you, your team sharpens up, you get more comfortable with more moving pieces, you know, even just the cash flow question of, hey, if you have to rent tents and, you know, secure permits and all of those things, well, maybe that's hard to do when you're very small, but over time you can grow up and actually, you know, build this and, and have a, a pretty major day. So and these these events are good tests, you know, to test small ones. And then also look at your your guests for ideas. They have a lot of good ideas. And you know, the average owner is going to be there talking to people. You get a lot of good ideas talking to the guests, you know, because what they like about this, what they don't like about it, or hey, last week I was just at this place. So you know, it's a good way to get some ideas from see what people like. Yeah. And connecting it to what people like about your brand, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, even if uh there's probably a standard range of events that you see out in the public, right? But knowing what sets you apart, um, what people like about your experience, build your, you know, your your event series off of that, thinking about the assets that you have at your disposal, right? If you are um, located in a central area that's, you know, has a lot of heavy foot traffic, you might have more of an angle with restaurants and co-partnering and that kind of thing. If you're in a more rural area, then use that asset, right? So thinking about, um, thinking critically and not just saying, hey, that went well for my friend who has, who also operates in this business. Well, that went well for them because, you know, it suits them. Now, I've, I'm sure everyone that's listening today has been to many breweries and wineries and the likes. And I know I've been to breweries that the, all they play is heavy metal. Well, it'd be weird for them to have a folk concert it wouldn't exactly their audiences don't chive so making exactly. sure that it suits who you are i i think that's important too you, that you hit that one very well because if that's what you're known for like you said you don't want to show up one day and all of a sudden they're doing something completely different it's like that's not why i come here <laughs> mm -hmm. it it's uh you know it's these days uh every part of the alcohol industry is getting more specialized and that's can be a good thing um it doesn't make sense to try and be everything to everyone. So I agree. building your events. And there's different focuses. Like I'm just recently saw one. It's about all about animals. It's the Humane Society. So mm -hmm. it's ales for tails. You know, there's, you've got a lot of different focuses you could have, whether it's, and it's sports events or trivia. I don't know that I've seen any, but I like the idea of book events. Maybe that's just me, but what a great place to go and, you know, maybe talk certain people have. Actually, I think I saw one in Richmond. Yeah. A brewery had like a reading club, which I thought would be really fun, you know? Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, you know, ways to bring people in, make them feel connections to your company. Now, like there are people, there are groups that you know are already bought in for your company, but for your business. And those are, you know, your members. And if you have a membership club, those are people that, you know, are already on board. So back in uh, April, uh, I had a webinar guest who talked up, talked about membership clubs and you know building events into those offerings. So, right, it's not just enough to say, "Hey, join our club. We'll send you, you know, a case of wine quarterly, or you're going to get first access to the beers." They want that personal connection. They're choosing you and your company as the someone they want to align themselves with. So. How can a members only events um, both you know support those members and also entice people to join those clubs? I had a really interesting experience. I spent the last two years up in northern Wisconsin 
in a very small resort town. And this woman up there opened a wine bar. It, this is beer drinking country. And she opened a wine bar. And I thought, great, because we need something like that, especially for women. You know, it's just a little bit of beautiful little wine bar, great selection. And then she started a club. She's only limited to 100 people. The first 100 people who signed up were in this club. And you got your own glass. It was kept there. It's got a number on it. So when you go in, you say you're this number and they give you your glass and you get a discount, you get certain things. It was crazy. People were on, once they found out about it, they had to get on the list and there was no getting, you know, it was hundred and done. There was no getting on that list if it was beyond a hundred. So if she really created something, it's just this, just this little bit of exclusivity and you've got your own mm -hmm. glass there and they kind of know who you are. And it was and she, good money for her because the, it was over a hundred dollars a year to join. And the glass certainly didn't cost a hundred dollars. It was a nice glass, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the year, you get to take it home. And you, you know, so I think there's a real benefit if you can find a way to just make it a little special for the members. And then there were members only events. So, and they weren't like super expensive or anything, but they, but they were, you know, she was making money off this. I mean, she had a good business model going on here, mm -hmm. but it was nice because you got first notice to all the events. And if there was still space, they would let other people in. But I mean, you always got first notice. So you know that you're in this club. It, did, it does get you something. I think that's the thing about mm -hmm. clubs. You have to have them give you, people want to get something. They don't want to just be a name in a club. They want to actually get something from it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to cost a lot. I think it's mostly about some sort of recognition some sort of special access to something. They, they feel like they've got special access to something and that you don't have to spend a lot of money to make people feel that way. And then there's emails, custom emails, or it's your birthday, you get a birthday, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's all pretty basic, but I think people do appreciate that. I, I like the idea of you know, the access, right? Because because like if you're having, having a membership club and people just get a discount, right? That's a sale essentially you know you're really not um all you're doing is you put money in and if you buy this much it pays off and that's it there's also like not really that much of a differential value because you say you pay a hundred dollars you get 10 percent off you know glasses of wine you could very easily do the math about how many glasses of wine it pays to get for that to pay off i think the kind of special access that people get from membership whether it's a members only event which you know can be small people may not even take advantage of it. So it's one of those, even when you're budgeting it out, you may only have 50% of your club members who turn up. So important to know that, you know, you can don't have to budget for every single person showing up every time. Um, or members only pre-sale saying, hey, we have a, our, a big festival, we have an event, you get first access to it because it usually sells out. Well, that's, there's a value to that, even if it's not, um, there's no real like monetary you know, you're not giving up any margin on that. All you're doing right, is to get right. guarantee or I always like, I think that again, people are trying to associate with your brand, the having the access to your people and your expertise, the peak behind the curtain aspect of that. So I think people in membership clubs love to hear from the winemaker, from the brewer, um, get the opportunity to take a look at things other people don't get to take a look at. Um, I know distillery. Like a wine club, the wine club or the beer club where you get your certain amount of wine every month and you maybe go to a pickup party. People like it. Again, it's going, okay, they get a little special access. Mm -hmm. They've got maybe a breakfast and they the, the winemaker is there, that kind of stuff. Again, mm -hmm. it doesn't cost a lot to do that, but people feel very much involved. Like especially the people behind the curtains that they can talk to the brewer or the winemaker people love that they, yeah. they eat that they love that and you know you obviously had talking about what we were saying before about getting the buy-in i know oftentimes winemakers or brewers aren't the most social people in the world sometimes they they like being in the back they're not front of house people but saying sometimes, hey it's important yeah. you know we're not putting you in front of a hundred people these are people who love the product who just want to hear from you and that can make all the difference they don't you know you, you don't have to do anything as far as saying, you know, oh, we're going to do a, a special blending just for our people. You know, you can have, you know, product specific to people, but just giving people access for a half hour before a larger event starts. There's not a lot of additional cost to that. Right. It can be really beneficial. And it really helps people who attend the main event and say, wow, who are those other people that got to go back there? Oh, those are the 
members of the club. Well, that's that's a good point to bring up for any of these kind of events, like especially your big ones. But if you've got that VIP experience on top of it, those people who get to get in a half hour earlier, an hour earlier, or they've got a VIP lounge, people really enjoy that too. I, you know, those things usually sell out. They've got a special table, maybe mm -hmm. everybody else has to walk around, but they've got a reserved table. And those that's, those can be money makers too. But I think a VIP, once you're up and running in some of these events, a VIP option can be very nice. Uh, that that can actually be a money maker. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a nice thing. You know, you want everyone to have a great time, but hey, if there's additional value that they get out of it, there's that's something to to be aware of. Um, yeah. Now, speaking again of of uh, the kind of special experience going beyond the VIP section into a fully private event, um, it's it's a great line of business if it works for your company. Um, but a lot of not a lot of people do this, or at least actively court private event bookings. So, how can a producer build private events into their overall strategy without compromising, you know, traditional regular operations? Yeah, it, it can be a little tough. I think I'm always thinking like weddings, things like that, or it could be birthday parties. But when I think of private events, I'm kind of thinking of weddings. And when you're talking about a winery or brewery, it's difficult because depending on what the, the space you have, but you don't want to interfere with your everyday guest because let's face it, Saturday is the day that everybody wants to be there. And that's the day that everybody wants to get married too. So you don't want to have to close your facility down to accommodate a bride. And then you don't want to make the bride wait until seven o'clock at night either. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of dancing that has to be done there. I think you have to have a specific facility that's dedicated for these private events or you have to just make it very clear from the outset, you know, we we can't start private events until after this time of day or certain days a week. It's just the way it, it's too hard to to feed both of those groups in the same way. So you've got to just make some clear designations. Maybe private weddings just don't work for us unless somebody's happy getting married on a Sunday afternoon or whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And not that people won't do it, but I think you have to just make it very clear because you're pulling extra staff, which could be stressful during your peak season. And then if somebody has been working all day, now it's, you need more people to work at night for a wedding or something. Again, it's, it's a lot of staff and let's face it, the last couple of years, staff has been hard to find in a lot of places because of COVID and for other reasons, there's a lot of staffing shortages. So asking people to pull these long hours and double shifts, it's, it's not easy. Um, and then always, for everything we've talked about here too, rain plan, rain plan, <laughs> like mm -hmm. especially you're talking about anything that takes place in a field, my God, have a rain plan, <laughs> just <laughs> that's the most important thing. But yeah, I think private events, they should be entered into very carefully. And again, it's not, maybe it's not everything for everybody. Maybe it's mm -hmm. just one kind of thing and your facility is open one day a week or something like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Somebody will want to use it, but just make sure you, you go into it knowing that there's just going to have to be limitations, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think setting the ground rules is really important, knowing that if it's a space constraint, if it's a staffing constraint, right, not everything is doable, right? And that's okay. It's okay to say no if somebody comes knocking. Um, but having ground rules for here's what we're willing to do, here's what we're capable of, um, you know, deciding how much information to put out into the world and how much to retain, because mm -hmm. you don't want to talk yourself out of a, you know, bigger sale. If somebody says, Hey, can I book your facility? I'll give you $5,000. Well, if you give them a, a sheet that says a thousand dollars, you just lost some money, but having your own rules of, okay, we're, we're able to accommodate groups of up to this amount. These are the days that we can do. And then even quantifying the opportunity cost. So if, Hey, if you want to book a full Saturday, here's what my Saturday sales traditionally are. That's how much you have to pay to start. Right. And that's then people all the do sudden, that. Yeah. People do that's, that. <laughs> that's okay. You know, it's okay. But if that's not for you, if that's going to upset your business, then don't. Right. You know, this is the private events are great if it's, hey, we only host private events Tuesday through Thursday and or Sundays, you know, up until whatever. That that's fine. But just being passive about it may mean that you're missing out on opportunities. I I always like the corporate bookings. I think those are really nice because, you know, there'll be a group that shows up, they'll be there for two to three hours. They have no problem with a budget. 
they right. take, they'll do Tuesday midday and it's just like a corporate retreat. And that's really nice because they're low drama relative to yes. Yes. somebody's big event. It's good. It's good money. It's reliable. It's yes. Those, those are good ones. Um, yeah, the weddings there's, I have mixed feelings, but, but anyway, again, yeah, there's all kinds and there's something for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The weddings, the weddings definitely want to be careful of because again, it's, you know, for many people, the biggest day in their lives. And if you don't have the staff or the space or the expertise to deliver on that, um, you don't want to disappoint somebody. That's yeah. the, you do not want to disappoint somebody. Yeah. Especially if somebody you don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so those are right general categories of, you know, events. There's all kinds of forms that they can take, right? All different structures, whatever it is, making sure that the things that you're committing yourself to are things that you can deliver on, that you have everything in place to be successful. Then of course, right, you know, trying to actually make sure that they are well attended, um, that they're going to be, uh, successful in in terms of just getting the people out and being worth the investment so can you talk about you know some of the tools or resources to that you know companies can leverage to get the most out of their event whether it's on the marketing side um you know actual traditional marketing or, or spend or maybe some of the sort of ways to to bring in partnerships i think you know obviously social media is a big one these days word of mouth again if you're your your best customers they are your best advertisers i think they're they, you're always if they're always getting your newsletter and they're saying oh i got to go to this this will be really fun and they send it to three other people you know i think that's really a great way to do it that cuz that's that's not that noise you that's that's a real something sending me something valuable as opposed to all the stuff that pops up when i'm on the internet you know, that's just noise this is something valuable that something's sending me so I think, um, and then utilizing partners, utilizing, if you've got a partner, utilize their mailing list, utilize their social media. Um, you can get on the radio to talk about it. That's always yeah. good. And people are willing to do that usually, or the community television spots, um, what's going mm -hmm. on today. But I think in this day and age, it, it's really so much about social media and um, yeah. worry about just sharing. I, yeah, yeah, it. making making it easy for people to share that about you. You know, I I definitely think starting with the people who are bought in, and that includes, like you said, partners, right? So if you constantly work with people, make it easy for them to share. Um, maybe they're involved in the event and they bring their own audience. Um, whether it's the social media side or, I mean, there's definitely people have different feelings about the targeted online marketing of ad buys on Facebook and those things. The good news is that. You could be very direct with that, saying, "Hey, this is a local only event. I'm only going to do in these, you know, handful of zip codes." Great, you know, that's fine if they have a Facebook profile and they say they have the word beer and they live in your zip code. They'll probably be interested in your event. That's fine. Um, and don't forget about organizations like yours, you know, who have or anybody with another website like Virginia yeah. Wine Marketing Association or their mm -hmm. brewery groups. They always want to advertise events too. So if you're yeah. a brewery, there are figure out all the industry groups that would be happy to advertise your event, or the local chamber of commerce, the local mm -hmm. convention and visitors bureau, um, those kind of things. They're always looking for stuff for their newsletters and for their event sites. So don't be afraid to reach out to some of those. It's usually free, but they can yeah. be very helpful because they've got a very wide reach. That's a great point. Regional tourism folks, Virginia Tourism Corporation. There's a lot of people whose job it is to promote yes. things that are happening. So make it easy for them. And the same goes for media. I used to be a, a beer writer and it is so nice to just have somebody say, I've got this thing rather than me having to go and find it. It becomes so much easier to promote an event. If I just have it all in one place, Hey, two paragraphs, here's the link for the tickets. Here's what they cost. Yeah. Great. And then one other thing that, that, I think that sometimes people overlook because, you know, it's, they think of it as kind of siloed your tasting room staff, right? You know, the people who are interacting with the customers, they need to know what's happening. Yes. Even if they're not working that event. They need to know the details. It needs to be easy for them to convey that, whether it's a flyer or, you know, there should be an events thing on the wall, but they need to know the basic details. So if somebody's coming in, this event is live. 
they need to be selling it to people like, Hey, do you like that? That glass of wine? Well, we're actually doing a rosé festival in a week. Oh, great. Right. That's those people are already there. Um, and if they're that's not, a very good about point. It, it. yeah, that's a very good point. Cause those are hopefully your 18 people and they should know, because again, if they're getting asked these questions, they don't know that that's a lost opportunity. Yeah. And back to the old fashioned poster on the wall. I'm all about that too, because yeah. heck, if you see it, you could take a snap a picture with your phone and you've got it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I do that all the time. So I think that's really key. What you said is those tasting room people, those, you know, they should be, they should really be knowledgeable about all of that stuff that it's a lost opportunity if they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. They are your frontline people. They need to know. Um, so, uh, with all of that, right, clearly we could be diving into all these different areas. Uh, there's, there's lots to, to work on here, but I think just as important as the sort of positive, um, things we talked about, it's helpful to know common failure points. So without naming, uh, any names, right. We don't want to air any dirty laundry for anybody. Um, what are, some of the biggest or most common mistakes that you've encountered when organizing or supporting an event? Um, one, and it's nothing that was anywhere. It was just unfortunate. The planners, they just really didn't have it, have a rain plan in it, in, in effect. And it's like all day long, it looked like it was going to rain and there was no good rain plan. <laughs> That's kind of what I would consider almost a rookie mistake at this point. But, but I mean, I think the biggest thing really is the communication. You mm -hmm. could solve a lot of problems by just having knowledgeable people and people who can think on their feet. So if they are given all the information, well, they can logically say, well, okay, if this is going to happen, then, you know, so keeping people really well informed, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the biggest way to avoid mistakes. And because also if something does happen, they can talk to people, calm them down, get them off mm -hmm. the, you know, keep people from going away with a bad taste in their mouth. I think that's very important. So really communicating people to your staff. And I, I think that's one of the most important things. And then basically, like I said, like a rain plan, like a good exit strategy, mm -hmm. and medical, you have medical aid, you know, what, what if yeah. something happens, what's your medical plan? Where's your first aid, things like that. But um, I think as far as the big things, though, those are the really big ones you want to think of that you want to, you got to get those right. You know, if somebody, the food isn't great, well, that that's one thing. But if if yeah. there's not a tent and it's a hundred degrees out that day and everybody's just dying where they say, you know, those kind of things, the big things are important to get right. Yeah, you control the variables you can. There are always those externalities that you have no way of controlling against, but there are so many unforced errors that, you know, hey, you ideally, if you're hosting an event, you've been to many, but what are the things that have gone wrong elsewhere? have a contingency plan and making sure that it's communicated. It doesn't do any good for information to have that plan in place. If people don't know about it, don't know when to stand it up. Right. I mean, you said the walkie talkie thing, if it's a Slack channel, whatever the format is saying, we've had to make this change because there's nothing worse when somebody shows up to an event, one person tells them one thing, one person tells them another thing. And all of a sudden, Hey, somebody told me I could park here and now I got a ticket or Somebody told me it would be only ten dollars for, uh, or it would be free for a designated driver. And now it's ten dollars. Why is this happening? Right. That's how people get the bad taste in their mouth. So, the I I have a a friend who always says for her business, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. Right. It's you need to tell have all of your people know what the rules of the road are, and make sure they're communicating that because if there's ambiguity, that's where mistakes happen. So and they feel bad and you don't want your employees, your staff to feel bad because they feel, and then that's a whole other level of problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially if these are your, your full-time people, right. And yeah. equipping them to succeed. Hey, if this is, you're responsible for the things that you can do. Um, yeah, this is, this is, I feel like we've, we've hit on a couple of themes over and over again, you know, the put, laying the groundwork, making sure your team is in good place, playing to your strengths having those contingency plans for, you know, rain or whatever the case may be. Um, and something that I always talk about, which maybe people don't love to talk about, which is the the dry, boring things that, hey, it's exciting to talk about the band, but like, do we have the AV? Do we have the power running out there? Do we have the permits? Those are the, the behind the scenes things that can absolutely ruin an event that nobody wants. So um, 
there's that's why, that brings up another good point chris it's like when we had large events we always did like a walk through the day before mm. all the key people were there for the walk through and that meaning okay the gates open at this time this is the traffic route and walking through every single piece of that day you know, hopefully you got it all on paper by that time but then you go stand out there and look around and then yeah. you, oh we forgot about this or do we need light in the parking lot? That kind of, so just things that it helps to just do, even in the week leading up, kind of a physical walkthrough for a big event to say, is this looking good? Can we fit, you know, it's, it, you really don't know until you walk the space. That's, that's a big help. And that shouldn't be done just the last day. That should be done. Yeah. Advance, you know? <laughs> no, that's a great point, especially if you're bringing outside people, right? You know, you can have a diagram, you can have all the details written in your action plan, but if you show people, here's where the stage goes, right? Here's here's where these tables are set up. There's no ambiguity. So that walkthrough yes. is very important. Um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong when, you know, that's nothing worse than when things get set up the wrong way and then you're rushing to move things when people show up. <laughs> I've been there. Um, well, Kathy, I really appreciate your time today. Um, we can see if there are any questions that come in, but um, while we do, and before I let you go, do you have any other parting words that you'd like to share with our audience? No, I think it's been great talking about this. It brings back some good old memories <laughs> and some big old headaches. It was a lot of fun. It's, you know, their events are always fun, but they're, they're a lot of work. But, you know, I think they could be very rewarding. So, um, yeah, I think it's good. Just try, try new ones and see what happens. It's, you know, start small, but they're definitely worth trying. It's a good way to attract people. It's a good way to, I think, really you're getting people to like you, you know, another, another reason for people to come out and like you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm happy to hear that when you said you, you were thinking back about him, that you thought of good times before you thought of the headaches, that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, but you're a pro at this and yeah, you know, you're, uh, if anybody ever wants to, to reach you, um, about this event stuff, they can find, uh, Kathy Artis on LinkedIn. So, um, appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with our audience today. Um, and thank you to all of the uh, people who have tuned into this program. We'll uh, be back with the next edition next month. But for now, I'd like to thank my speaker, Kathy Artis, again. Thanks. Great. Thank you. It's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, and thanks, Chris and Kathy, and for everyone for attending today. I did just post a poll. If um, folks who are still here could take a moment just to fill that out, that helps us be able to better serve you moving forward. Um, but I appreciate every um, I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to this recording. If you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. And we hope to see you all at our next session. Take care, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.